Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined. Uh, I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is Phil Christman. Uh, Phil, could you introduce yourself? Hey, folks. Uh, I'm Phil Christman. I am a lecturer at the University of Michigan. Uh, I teach mostly freshman writing. Uh, and I write essays about a variety of things. Um, my stuff appears in the Hedgehog Review a lot. Um, I've been in Commonweal and Christian Century quite a bit. Just had a piece in the outline, which uh, sounds like we're going to talk about. Um, so that's that's my deal. Uh, thank you for coming on today. Yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, a couple of pieces you've written recently. Uh, the first one uh, was published in the Hedgehog Review. I will include a link to it below. Uh, the headline is, What is it like to be a man? And I thought this was a... Uh, really interesting essay and uh, the main reason I wanted to have you on today and then we'll also be discussing a piece that you wrote uh, that ran in the outline um, just yesterday the day before uh, called Religion is Not Always About Certainty. Uh, but let, let's start with the hedgehog piece. So uh, yeah, so what what is it like to be a man? <laughs> what, what, what's the answer? Uh, I, you know, I hated... I hate the idea, in, in theory, I hate the idea of writing essays about, like, these big platonized categories. Like, uh, I'm, like I felt stupid and self-conscious every time that someone would ask me what I was writing at the moment while I was working on this essay, and I would have to, I'm writing about masculinity. Um, <laughs> I, I do not feel adequate to answering that question. Um, Another piece of mine that that had Hedgehog ran that did well is about being Midwestern, and um, I it that was also largely about how I feel like conflicted about these gigantic, you know, Platonic categories, um, which I, I get that that's becoming I guess that's becoming something I do is that I write essays about categories I don't completely trust. <laughs> um, but what comes up in the essay is. You know, when I when I when I tried to look back on my own experience and say, what specific things do I think are, are maybe not completely unique to men, but what are things in my experience that I feel like I don't hear uh, women talking about as much? The first thing that kind of came to mind was this sort of grandiose and an often unnecessary concern with protecting others or with being ready to protect others in a way that has often has absolutely no connection to the stuff that I actually do that is helpful to the people in my life. So like just, you know, stepping in front of a punch because you you love your friend like that's one kind of thing. That's 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 actually useful. You've you've done that person a service, and and a woman can do that. And women do do that, um, but doing a stupid amount of weightlifting when I don't like it that much because I want to be prepared to kick someone's ass. Well, whose <laughs> ass? Why? No, ass. You know, it's just it's just out there in the world, and I must be prepared to kick it. That leap into like an abstract rage to protect uh, is is what felt distinctly masculine uh, about my experience and, and, and the guys I know. Yeah, that, and that's interesting. And I think you see that a lot in uh, American culture and the myths we tell ourselves. You know, it's like the Western myth is about the like white man going out and like civilizing the you know untamed country and protecting his wife and children from. Uh, you know the savage natives, and um, you know our. It's not good. It's not a good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I actually just just saw. Um, oh god, the name just went out of my head. So I'll skip it. I, I saw a classic western on the big screen recently. Um, that uh, is uh, John Wayne. It's, it's a revision. It's one of John Ford's revisionist westerns. Searchers. Yes, the Searchers. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's you know that is <laughs> kind of exploring that myth of, you know, the white man needing to protect the family. Um, so that's, like, very core to American culture. And then there's, like, American gun culture, which is all about, um, 
you know, uh, self protection, and maybe the founders originally thought it was it would be about uh, preventing a tyrannical government from uh, taking over and keeping the citizenry uh, powerful. But now it's you know the message of gun culture is this is to protect uh, you yeah. and your family from outside threats from bad guys. You actually you actually hear people, and this language I think comes down to us. It comes from Hollywood and gets filled, like law enforcement has picked it up in a way that really troubles me. You hear people use the phrase bad guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, I gotta. I need a gun to protect me from bad guys. Um, yeah, and, which, and the cliche phrase is, you know, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Right, right. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, one of the things... I, I ended up ha- cutting it from the essay because things too damn long anyway. But one of the th- one of the things that I kind of started from as I was writing the essay was my panicked, the precise form that my election night 2016 panic took. Because as soon as soon as like it was one of those thoughts that as soon as it pops into your head, you start being like, wait a minute, that's crazy, and it w- it was this. Uh, <clears throat> oh my God, Donald Trump's in charge. I need to take my wife and the other people living in my house and we need to move out to the country and I need to learn how to shoot and do all that guy shit <laughs> and I need to protect them. And then I thought about it and I look, okay, here's the constitution of my household on election night, 2016. It's my wife who runs a prison arts program. Okay. You, you, you cannot you cannot be married to that person and have that mindset because there are many times when my wife is is alone with people who have taken you know, different when they were younger, stupid, or worse people took human life, right? Um, like, and my wife is a pacifist who will not let me have a gun. Like, if if I move out to the country and get a gun, I'll be doing it alone. Uh, the, other, the other people in my household at that moment were like. Two students who we were letting stay with us, working class black men who theoretically have everything to fear from a white guy with a gun, like, you know, like, and may not be too welcome in some of the suburbs and uh, small towns of Michigan. Uh, like, so it was a completely, it, it was on the one hand, a completely like practical it was me trying to be practical. How do I take care of vulnerable people who I feel responsible to in this new situation? Uh, And on the other hand, it was the most, the categories that existed in my brain were such that my attempt to be practical was like the most impractical, ridiculous thing uh, that I I could have thought. Mm -hmm. Right. So how how did I get there? What, what, What was in my brain that, that, would make that even a, a, a thought I could have. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so what, yeah, so this core sense that men are supposed to protect their uh, families is, you know, we could trace it back to maybe, uh, you know, in, in an evolutionary psychology way to hunter gatherer, you know, societies and, uh, you know, men being the more physically powerful uh, half of the, of the gender a spectrum. Uh, you know, they would need to protect the group from invading tribes or something like that. Like, that's one conceivable explanation. And then there's more, like, cultural, you know, the cultural stories we tell ourselves about uh, men in power and, like, what men have to do. Um, do what do you see as, as the origin of this of this idea? Yeah, I mean, I don't... <laughs> that's another one that's probably above my pay grade, but I, I, I can say... One of the things that I say in the essay is is that I'm, yeah, I mean, deep evolutionary history, um, in one way, like obviously plays a role in what we are now. But I, I tend to be suspicious of the the tendency to go there. I partly because I I think when you just observe what human beings are, we are an enormously complex species that that really doesn't make any sense and that there usually isn't a, a super simple explanation for what we are. Like, 
we, we are the species that refuses to be totally defined by the story of our speciesood. So that's, that's one reason. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, I didn't engage with the term settler colonialism, partly because I feel like that's one of those terms you got to read. There's like five specific books you have to read before you're like licensed to use settler colonialism. <laughs> it, it's like saying Anthropocene. It's like you, 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 no, you can't say Anthropocene until you've read these five books. I don't think other people feel that way. That's just a weird scruple I have. So uh, it's it's a term I didn't use, but like the basic idea, like you were talking about a minute ago, uh, you know, the men in America sold themselves this bill of goods about protecting uh, our wives and children from from those guys over there, because we had to we had to we had to be sold on that in order to create this roaring capitalist enterprise that we have now. Um, like that's the kind of place where I tend to look first, mm -hmm. but, you know, before I, I start thinking, Oh, maybe evolutionary psychology can explain this or especially cause I mean, I have to imagine that any woman who's a product of a hunter gatherer society, like any full grown able bodied adult woman could kick my ass. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I mean, yes, on average, we're stronger, but it, that, that, that's an average, you know? I mean, there's so many exceptions to that rule. And there, and women, I, I don't want to get into, like, kiss-assy male feminist-type rhetoric here, but women have always been distinctively and impressively strong in their own ways, especially, like, you, you know, you hear those stories of women lifting a car off their kid. I mm -hmm. mean, there's just looking at what we are in a kind of raw biological way, it seems like there's a number of directions you could go besides, ah, men are the strong ones, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of like start out with, you start the essay with this uh, stereotype of like the man as like the incompetent bumbler. And I feel like this was the like stereotype of manhood that, like was present in popular culture through like my childhood. So like Homer Simpson would be the archetype. And that's like, uh, that archetype is, is taken from other sitcoms where, you know, the, the man is like a kind of dunce character and the woman is the clever one uh, who can manipulate the man and, and get things done. And, you know, it's like Archie Bunker and there's, there's lots of, you know, the King of Queens and Ray Romano and there's lots of mm -hmm. like, very stereotypical sitcom examples of of this kind of idea of you know men don't know what they're doing and they always fuck things up and etc then uh, kind of the one kind of counter narrative that maybe has emerged more strongly in the recent past is like uh you know men as insidious predators and mm -hmm. um certainly the me too stories uh depict men as as <laughs> this this type of person who are uh, constantly trying to uh, take advantage of women and exploit women. And uh, you see a lot of this kind of, like this seems to be the more popular stereotype to make jokes about and, uh, and toss around like on social media than, mm -hmm. uh, than like the Homer Simpson stereotype mm -hmm. of the man of yeah like men are you know men are trash so that's a phrase you could see <laughs> you know if you search that on twitter you would see thousands of results and um and yeah so so you know homer simpson would not be smart enough to like engineer the kind of uh, sex sexual harassment or sexual exploitation or uh, sexual violence plots that some of the you know that bill cosby and harvey weinstein um committed over the years uh, so, the, so, you know, <laughs> neither of these are, are, uh, flattering in any way <laughs> towards, yeah. towards the, uh, towards men. Um, yeah. What, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> um, I mean, the former one can be kind of the first, the first story I think can be sort of stealth flattering in a way, just in that all those guys in those sitcoms all have like not only clever wives, they usually, with the exception of Marge uh, Simpson, they, they also have hot wives, mm -hmm. which, 
it, it's kind of like I, I don't tend to read to read that whole trend this way, um, but I, I, I think a, a su- sufficiently suspicious person could almost read the Homer Simpson story as giving us plausible deniability for like the reality of what a lot of men in the entertainment business were, were actually getting up to at the moment. You know, they were competent to run things and they ran things and they, what they ran was like many empires of, of rape and sexual assault. Um, yeah. And I mean, as for the other story, like, <laughs> I mean, like anybody, I, I'm hurt when I read the phrase, men are trash but like i don't <laughs> those those guys are trash you know and, well and uh, i i think probably no one read no man reads men are trash and thinks it's directed at them it's directed at the other ones the bad ones oh i totally uh i don't know I, this is probably just the anxiety do- disorder talking but i always <laughs> i always first read anything that could be about me as an attack on me and then i go no 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 that's you're being paranoid they mm. In those ones, um, but I, and I also think that the 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 phrases like that uh, catch on because I mean one of the really horrifying things about me too is is that you have to think about the the ways in which our discourses about masculinity make it so that there's kind of a continuum between like mo- most. Most guys will look at Harvey Weinstein and go, man, that's fucked up, right? Um, we're not that far gone, right? Um, <clears throat> but there's the Me Too stories about famous people have been on a kind of continuum. Mm-hmm. A lot of people defended Aziz Ansari, um, which, I mean, we, we can get into the details of that, but like, you know, that woman, she, she did say no pretty explicitly. And, um, but we are so brainwashed that the idea should be, you should be chasing every, chasing down every sexual opportunity. In fact, if you aren't doing that, you're kind of a loser. Um, that, that, you know, there's a part of me that, that found, that finds, you know, his actions much more, you know, like I haven't, I haven't done that, but like I can see a version of myself who who would behave that way, and mm-hmm. that's that's sickening, you know. Like it's forced to moral reckoning, uh, which which I think is good. So neither of these, neither of the stories you mentioned are the full truth about uh, about men, but I, I mean the second one at least is is useful <laughs> in a certain way. Uh huh. Yeah, and the uh, I think the the reason the Ansari episode resonated is because, you know, um, a famous person asking you you to watch him masturbate like that probably that's a outlier. The Louis C.K., Bill Cosby, Weinstein like these are far outliers. Whereas the kind of story narrated in the uh, infamous Babe.net article about Ansari seems more like something that could regularly happen to people and. Uh, they would both go away, you know, like, okay, they wouldn't both go away. Uh, and, uh, the man would go away feeling like nothing went wrong. I had sex. Yeah, and the woman would go away, like, feeling some level of regret or something, but probably wouldn't, like, yeah. talk about it publicly or bring charges or, or anything like that before this uh, cultural change that, that we're experiencing. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah, that was the, the <laughs> that was the, you know, people are still talking about that one. Uh six months later because it does seem more like the the regular world that people who are not, you know, moral monsters like Weinstein and Cosby are like, you know, could could conceivably experience. It's it's more of a critique of of, of everyday life. Um yeah. Um so you know, it seems like, you know, it's I guess it's I don't know how long people have been saying there's been a crisis of masculinity, maybe maybe always <laughs> But it does seem like there's some kind of crisis of masculinity, masculinity now based on what particular what some men are embracing uh, about being a man. So uh, one group of men are joining uh, this group called the Proud Boys. It's probably only you know less than a thousand people who are doing mm-hmm. this, but they uh, have gotten publicity. And it's this group. If you haven't heard of it, it's uh, one of the founders of Vice uh, Magazine, 
uh, mm-hmm. took a turn towards uh, white nationalism after he founded the magazine, or maybe he already was a white nationalist when he founded the magazine. And uh, his name is Gavin McInnes, I believe, and he uh, started this group uh, called the Proud Boys that is kind of, I don't know, it's a little bit like Fight Club, it's a little bit like um, live-action role-playing, uh, LARPing, it's uh, kind of like uh, a fraternity, like a college fraternity for guys who were unable to get into a college fraternity or never went to college, and they do things like um, where, you know, go to, like, protests and wear, like, black helmets and uh, body armor and so there, there's like a there's like a white nationalist, a white supremacist angle to it, but it's that's the, like not not the main thing. The main thing is like as I as I understand it, you know, like kind of embracing one's masculinity and uh, not like shying mm-hmm. away from it in the way that uh, you know modern life uh, forces one to do in their in their critique of like the human you know like the human resources uh, version of reality that they see and then i I, i'm worried about saying his name because whenever i do people in the comments get mad at me but uh jordan peterson is another example of um people of young people uh searching for an answer to to like what what does being a man uh, i am so shocked that his his people haven't come for me yet because like i thought i insulted him clearly enough in the essay but Every every time I've mentioned him on this platform, people have gotten angry at me and said I haven't, you know, I'm not treating him fairly. I haven't read the work. I haven't watched the videos. Um, so, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson, the, the the word has been spoken and <laughs> come at me if you want. Because right, he's he's such a master of 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 this weird move that uh, which I think is kind of a spineless and manipulative move where he says what sounds like the super abstract theorized version of something more or less fascistic. And then you'll push him on it and then he'll be like, Oh no, 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 no. I meant the most innocent possible interpretation of that statement. So he'll say things like, um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to come up with a like on the spot example, but you know, he'll, he'll say things like in a, the equivalent of saying like when culture is changing very rapidly because of demographics, then, you know, people can start to feel displaced and they rightly lash out. And there's a version of that statement that, you know, there's like a couple of different ways you can parse that. But so he, he, he walks on both sides of the street. It's so he can always do that. You're like, you're not representing me honestly. And it's like, ah, oh, quit playing games, man. Yeah. This is the, uh, Nathan Robinson and his piece in current affairs, uh, made this critique, uh, most, most explicitly that he says things that are obscure and can be interpreted in multiple ways. Some of those mm-hmm. ways, uh, being, uh, very bad. And then if one challenge about them, he always retreats back to, uh, yeah, he's, he's chance the gardener from being there. Okay. This is the exact metaphor I've used multiple times on blogging. And so <laughs> I agree. Yeah, he is. He's, Great he's, he's, he's Chauncey Gardner <laughs> and he says these, uh, gnomic things and people are wowed by them. And, um, yeah. And so uh, when I, when I made, I, when I made this exact critique, I said, you know, he's saying things like, uh, clean your room. And then people are like, don't you know that clean your room, is not just a simple statement. It involves many layers and involves getting your, you know, you need to get your life in order before you can do anything else. But it also means clean your room. And there's people. Your room is an allegory. <laughs> yeah, but like, but you actually should clean your room. So it's like, what, what is he actually saying? Okay, but p- putting aside um, yeah. go, uh, Jordan Peterson's, whether or not he is like a um, snake oil salesman or not, like mm-hmm. his message is attracting people and it's attracting young men. And what he's saying about, um, manhood and gender difference is appealing to a lot of people uh, mm-hmm. right now. So it's, we should take, take that part of it seriously. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I have learned over the course of being married and I tried to s- sort of, you know, I tried to, I don't know that I explicitly say it in the essay, but I, I like the whole essay is informed by it is that, I have in the con- in the context of my marriage where there's this immediate everyday thing where 
uh, I that is is it's very high stakes. It's very important to me. It's very important to Ashley. Um, and uh, you know, it's one of those things that you make or break all of the time with like millions of, of like just little actions every day. Uh, I have in that context, I have never learned anything about my duty to her by asking myself, what would a man do? Am I being manly enough? <laughs> that question has not helped me once. And it literally not once. And it, um, yeah, I mean, there have been times when I've thought, you know, maybe uh, what I need to do is something like more traditionally macho. And it's, it's actually been counteradaptive. The question that has helped me feel that I have a role that the, the question that has helped me feel that I have a role to play in the world that has helped me feel useful to other people that has helped me to feel like I, I have a valid role to play in society, which I think is what we're really talking about when we talk about crises of masculinity, or when we talk about what, what Jordan Peterson, the, the good part of what Jordan Peterson fans want, you know, the part of their, their need that is legitimate. The question that has, has helped me get there is, how do I be a good person? And it's boring. Uh, you know, there aren't, it's, it's, there aren't a lot of fun movies about it, but I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't look cool, but like, that is the only question that has ever made me a better husband to my wife. Um, mm -hmm. and so I guess, I mean, to a, and the problem is that this is not terribly sexy, you know, but, I guess the thing that I would say to young men who, who have, who have that sense of like, what's my place in the world? You know, what, what am I here for? Uh, and, and Jordan Peterson tells me I just need to clean my room and, uh, feminists tell me other things. And, and sometimes they say men are trash and it makes me feel bad. And so mm, feminism, whatever. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, uh, some people tell me to go to college. Some people tell me to get a job. There are all these discourses. I mean, I do feel, I, I feel for any young person who finds modern life confusing, right? Um, whatever their gender. So for young men who are like, what's, what's my place in the world? The only question that has ever helped me get anywhere and, and get to a place where I feel that I'm contributing is what would a good person do? Gender free. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't offer something sexier, uh, both because I, 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 I really would like to, you know, help people and because, you know, then I could have a lifestyle brand uh, <laughs> for Peterson and that would be cool. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think Jordan Peter, maybe this is a misreading, but uh, of, and I haven't read the primary text, as I said before, but Peterson seems to you know, say like you, sh like he, the reason he emphasizes all these like modern, like uh, mythical stories and fables and uh, biblical stories is that like, you need to be the hero of your own life and like take control and stop blaming your problems on, uh, on other things. And so that's kind of like a self-help one-on-one mm -hmm. uh, piece of advice, you know, like you can, like only you can tr truly change yourself and, mm -hmm. um, and you have to start, you know, you have to start with yourself and he's packaged it in a way that is appealing to, uh, you know, this, this era of, of American and Canadian civilization. Um, there's one, there's one other angle I wanted to ask. I, I don't think you, um, touched on this in the, uh, piece, but you know, this, this age we live in now is also an age in which, uh, definitions of gender are being questioned in all sorts of ways that are relatively novel, um, yeah. you know, there's more people who are trans, um, there's, uh, more, uh, kind of experimentation going on with gender. There's people, you know, I don't think I had, had heard the phrase gender non-binary 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. so that's, seems like a recent development. Um, you have things like, uh, that I've just noticed in the past, like a couple months, like, uh, there's a lot of. Uh, teenage boys and young men who have like makeup tutorials on uh, YouTube and have achieved like a level of, of fame uh, in that, in that space. That's tr traditionally 
female dominated it. And this is like not entirely new, like, you know, since the sixties, like in the sixties, seventies and eighties, they're all, you know, there's like glam rock and, uh, you know, David Bowie and, <laughs> and people who challenged uh, traditional gender presentation and stuff. But it does seem like more of it is happening. You know, anytime there's people challenging these core parts of human identity, there's going to be a backlash. So you have, you know, it's, I, I like, there's maybe it's stupid to say this, but I feel like there are actual Americans out there who like voted for Trump because of like the transgender bathroom issue and like the growing prominence of trans people like that was unnerving to them. And then Trump was promising traditional values and his whole um, persona is alpha male and uh, you know, making things the way they were in some idyllic past. Uh, yeah, the, uh, do you have any thoughts on how the, this more questioning of gender and the gender binary is shaping like the, the idea of manhood? Well, so the very first thing I would say, uh, just taking your last remark, is that if if anybody happens to be watching this, you know, and, and you voted for Trump because you think he's a real alpha male, those people really need to consider the Chapo critique of Trump, which is that he's an ultra ultra whiny. Uh, like gossip obsessed, you know, New York media, like there's nothing traditionally masculine about the way that he presents most of the time. I mean, he, he, he talks tough, he talks tough, but like, honestly, I would not want Trump to be like the buddy I was with. If I was, if I was afraid I was going to get my ass kicked by another guy at the bar. I, no, he's a he's a total wuss, baby, whiny, you know, complainer. Child he's, of privilege. He's, he's constantly complaining privilege. about people being unfair to him. Like, is that is that a masculine trait? This is this actually was just tweeting about this the other day that like he's always saying people are unfair to him. He's always demanding apologies from people. Like the media needs to apologize to me. Nancy Pelosi needs to apologize to me. Like this is not John Wayne. Like John Wayne never asked the, uh, you know, chief scar to apologize to him. This is, this is such a trait of the kinds of like reactionary uh, masculinist movements that you were talking about a minute ago, though. They're all, they're all babies, you know, the, the proud boys, uh, you know, they want to look tough and, Oh, we're going to beat up those Antifa. But, like one, I've I've I know some Antifa, and uh, the proud. Uh, I don't think the Proud Boys would quickly mess with some of these people, inc- including the women. And two, they're they're so whiny. Uh, I mean, they're constantly. You know, people call us Nazis. We're not really Nazis. <laughs> we kind of are, but. Uh, um, I was just listening to the a related phenomenon, Richard Spencer. I was just listening to the clip where he gets punched and he was doing his usual ultra pedantic professorly thing of like, no, 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 no. The, re- the white supremacists hate me and the real Nazis hate me and I'm not popular within, you know, and in, in, in demanding that you memorize every flavor of like racist, neo-fascist asshole and, and position him correctly within that spectrum. And then he gets punched it's beautiful um you know these people are these people fascism is isn't manly yeah you know it's not any good version of manly getting a getting a bunch of people together to kick the ass of the one jewish person in your town or the one trans person in your town is the opposite fucking manly as far as i'm concerned like grow a pair so that's the first thing um and there must there there must be some truth. I, I was looking sheepish when you first brought up the subject of trans people, um, because I feel like that's a, I don't even know if it's a flaw in the essay, but it's it, that is a pheno- ph- phenomenon with which the essay doesn't engage much, um, and it's not because I didn't try. I, you know, I did research, and what I basically found is that the first generation of like, or the older generation of there's you know we're, there have been many. There've been trans people all along, but uh, the older generation of trans writers talked very much about this experience of feeling um, I'm a man in a woman's body, I'm a woman in a man's body, and that the current generation of trans writers, uh, trans men and women writers, have really kind of rejected that framing, and so there wasn't there wasn't a simple thing that I was from the web of experiences and things that we call you know, trans 
non-binary and some of these other labels and, and questioning gender. There wasn't one or two single points or critiques that I could bring out of that and say, how does my experience look in light of this? It's too complex of a phenomenon. So I ended up just being like, I have a footnote where I just basically throw up, I reference a really good Andrea Long Chu article, and then I say, uh, I basically just verbally throw up my hands. And and then I felt bad because it's, I worried trans readers would read it and be like, he's just dismissing us in a footnote. When I think actually the whole article, I, I don't know how conceivable a lot of what I'm saying is it even would be in a discursive environment that didn't have people sort of chipping away at the idea of gender for, you know, several decades in it. Um, what else were you asking? I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know if there was more than that, but I, I, I've had this thought, and maybe this is this will get me in trouble, but, it, you know, there's a part of, like, the trans um, movement that like uh, is breaking down gender, the gender binary, obviously. And then there's like a part that's like reifying the gender binary because um, people who transition <laughs> often want to, um, you know, present as like purely that gender they transitioned into. Um, and so, you know, is this, I think this is why some like, feminists uh critique the trans movement as saying that it's just like supporting the patriarchy and like supporting uh you know it's, there's this crazy critique that it's like you know men like purposely trying to become women to like undermine women or something that doesn't make sense to me but there there it does seem to be something about you know the like trans the trans uh, transgender man who like is posting selfies of that look exactly like like a gym bro or something uh, would post and you know is it, it's not it's not like trans people need to uh, strike blows against the patriarchy as part of their identity like that does, that's not a uh, thing one yeah, one would expect of anyone. It's asking, it's asking too much. Like transitioning is hard enough. Like we we can't we have to be careful. Uh, and you, you probably didn't mean to be doing this but we got to be careful about like saying oh you got to be trans this way so that the patriarchy will be deconstructed on schedule but right. as as outside observers watching those conversations like yeah i don't i don't think it's weird to be to be confused sometimes either like i i've, I've had those sorts of questions myself and the the andrea long chu article that i footnoted in the essay um where i kind of throw up my hands uh on liking women she she deals with all that all of that really interestingly i mean i do think i do think there is a way in which um even if you transition into the most traditionally whatever version of of whatever it is you're transitioning to simply by showing that Simply by trans, by having transformed, right? You're you're suggesting that there's something cultural and artificial uh, about about the way we perform those identities. Mm -hmm. Now I'm that I've said something unknowingly offensive, but yeah, this is a minefield. Uh, I guess just the last thing I would say on it is um, <laughs> the YouTube personality uh, ContraPoints did a video recently. <laughs> Uh, on this topic, um, she's really good. She was actually on this uh, program um, about a year ago, and uh, yeah, and she kind of gets at the. She portrays these different uh, different characters in conversation, and one of them is a uh, transgender woman who is like embracing ultra femininity and like stereotypes about women, and uh, one is not, and they go back and forth about like who is hurting the cause more, and what I, what I like about ContraPoints a, a lot is she. Um, has uh, disparate views in conversation and doesn't necessarily always come down on one side or another. And it's and both sides kind of make, make valid points and you can, you can make up your own mind, but uh, yeah. I, I love ContraPoints and I loved that video in particular. And I loved it in part because I, I mean, I think people get into her cause she's a really good debater. She's really good at owning people she disagrees with. Um, but when she shows, when she kind of opens up 
and and I know this is a lot of emotional work for her because she's talked about it. Um, and uh, you know, I feel, I, I I feel I feel for her, and that is why I contribute to her Patreon. <laughs> she is reimbursed for that uh-huh. emotional work, but um, it she, I think. I think when she op- kind of opens up her own brain and shows the different pieces of her fighting it out um, about things like that. And also like she did something similar uh, about Nazi punching, mm-hmm. you know, she, her inner, her inner punk rock Antifa and her inner like bougie leftists, you know, fought it out. I, those are actually my favorite contrapoints videos. I, she is so sharp and so interesting. Um, and, she states both sides of her own internal conflict so well. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and she did a Jordan Peterson critique, which was more one-sided, but uh, I encourage people to check that out as well. Um, Very, yeah. Maybe we should shift to the other article uh, we wanted to discuss, uh, which is headlined, Religion is Not Always About Certainty. And uh, this is part of a series that the outline is doing about like question, like what piece of... Cr- conventional wisdom like rubs you raw or do you do you want to take issue with um mm-hmm. so can you uh, kind of outline what you discuss in this piece wah, wah, outline <laughs> uh, <laughs> no pun intended yeah so be, I, i've always been there's this there's this meme that uh religion is something that people are involved in because they're looking for a sense of certainty in life um and I, I, sometimes people will say that just very directly, like, um, you know, I, I, there's a quote in there from a wonderful essay by Dorothy Fortenberry, who's a wonderful writer, uh, where she talks about how people will actually sometimes say to her, like, oh, I wish I could be Catholic. It must be nice to have that certainty. And like, like Dorothy Fortenberry is a writer. Like, by definition, she's not certain about shit. You don't <laughs> become a, writer, a good writer because you're certain about stuff. And she talked about, well, I wish I had your certainty. I wish I knew for a fact that there's no God and Sundays are for brunch. That would be great. You know, I wish I didn't have this uh, series of beautiful but difficult open questions that, you know, structure my whole life. Uh, and that, like, I really, I really resonated with that, and I just wanted to kind of carry her her line of argument forward. But the more, the more insidious way that I think that uh, that idea is encoded into discourse is just in the very common kind of journalistic truism that uh, religion is something people turn to in order to have some, like a very one bit of epistemological firmness in complex and uh troubled times which i'm like when are the uncomplex and untroubled times and <laughs> what does church attendance look like then so that's <laughs> well that you just that reminds me of um the infamous uh clinging to guns and religion a comment from yeah. obama yeah which obama the fact i mean i tend to to assume that obama is pretty i mean it's it's a somewhat watery liberal Christianity, but the, the version of Christianity that he believes in, he believes in very strongly. Like I, Obama is a religious person. Mm-hmm. Everybody forgets this now, but that is why uh, he had such crossover appeal. I, I was just reading Frances Fitzgerald's amazing book about evangelicalism recently, and she reminded me of this cultural moment that I, I had already forgotten, where all these evangelicals in 2008 were like, ah, you know, I like this guy um, mm-hmm. and you know, campaign for him even. And um, the fact that a person is devoutly religious as, as Obama even says stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I think it's somewhat true about the guns, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that, 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 that is un you know, and the, the, at points in my life, it's been kind of un, a piece of unreflective conventional wisdom that I've bought into, even though I know from my own religious practice that, uh, you know, there are days when I'm like, I would give the possibility of God's existence a three out of 10. And my confidence in the resurrection, which is like the cornerstone of Christianity, I, I, I think Christianity without it is kind of pointless, is like at a one or a two. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I know from experience that it's wrong, but it's so uh, it's so embedded in the culture. It's hard to, to think outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, so I encourage people to check out this piece. It's it's interesting, and um, you talk a little bit about your own uh, religious past and what you the church you were raised in. I had never heard of that denomination before. Can you, um, can you is that? I assume it must be a fairly okay. small one. Yeah, it's small, and it's it's one of the you know it's a very typical Baptist story. I. I I may be getting this wrong, but if you if you they split off from another body of Baptists because the other body of Baptists didn't have a su- sufficiently hardline position on card playing and lodge membership and shit like this. So like, and they used I, I looked them up on Wikipedia recently. I was like, oh, the GARB. I haven't thought about them in a while. They use impact as a as a verb in their official statement of beliefs. <laughs> so I was like, I was feeling ecumenical until I saw that. And then I was like, burn the fucking heretics. <laughs> okay. So you, as a writer, you wouldn't have lasted in that, in that particular church, uh, for long. Uh, yeah, that's actually one of my few, uh, linguistic <laughs> no, pet peeves is impact as a verb. Um, and then what do you uh, affiliate with a denomination currently? I'm an Episcopalian. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the, this piece was interesting to me because, um, I was raised in a Jewish household and, um, I, I was at some point I was like looking back and I don't know if I ever really believed in God, even as a small child, you know, when it it was just, I don't know, it was more like this was this thing we were doing, uh, you know, it was a, a conservative, um, uh, Judaism, you know, that particular, uh, branch of, uh, American Judaism, and I kind of like I, I didn't like it at all because it, it would like take up time when I could have be, could have been like playing video games or watching TV or something like having to go to Hebrew school and so on and so forth. And I w- w- would have much rather slept in on Saturday mornings rather than have to go to uh, services. Um, and then I kind of just like I think I was maybe atheist for a little bit, but then I, I landed on just agnosticism. Um, as the the only thing I could really say, the, the only thing I could say for sure was like I'm not sure. Um, so that sense of uncertainty and doubt. Um, well, and I, you know, it's with Judaism is unusual in many ways, but also you know, there's kind of a uh, you know cultural um, heritage that stays with you even if you are not firmly a believer. And there's people who are you know like atheists will still describe themselves as Jewish. So I still like think of myself as Jewish, but. Um, uh, yeah, but just like without really any of the beliefs, but also not not rejecting the possibility of uh, of you know a, a supernatural creator. Um, so it, yeah, so it was always you know for me there were yeah there, there was never like a real moment of of certainty in my in my religious past, um, and it's always it's always been it's always been something filled with doubt. Yeah, muddled. Yeah. A very muddled experience. No, I mean, I've heard a lot of Jewish people talk about that, that feeling of like, is this, a, is this things that I believe or is this just things that I'm doing? Is, is, is Judaism, you know, is, is, does it, can there be atheist Jews? I mean, is it, is it, is it a name of a people and a set of constitutive practices? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, there, I mean it's, there, there's a great example of the complexity of the of the things that we try to smush together and and simplify by calling them religions. Yeah, it, it seemed to me that uh, it seems to me that Judaism has a lot a lot less emphasis on belief and a lot more on action. So there's you know there's like 613. Uh, uh, Talmudic or uh, like mitzvahs in the Torah, and, and the Talmud prescribes all these uh, rules of behavior that you know, from what you eat to what you wear to how you uh, you know conduct yourself on uh, the Sabbath. And yeah, it's more like you're doing this thing. Um, but I, the sense I always got was like you're doing the, these things because God wants you to do them. But there's no more, like, and and they have like some ethical reason to to do them. But it's different from other religions in that it's, it's like there was a, a very, at least in my uh, division of, Ju- of Judaism, there was very little emphasis on um, the afterlife and any sort of eternal reward. Whereas that, yeah. that that was a sense I got from, that I picked up about Christianity is that 
you know, it's much more about belief, accepting Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, and then thinking about like how great things are going to be when you can finally uh, join Jesus in the afterlife. Yeah, my impression is that it's it's an idea that is developing by the time of Jesus because it's it's a point of controversy that uh, you know the Sadducees and others ask him about. But I, I mean, one of the uh, if you if you take an introduction to the Hebrew Bible course, one of the things one of the first things they're going to say is, as far as we can tell, definitely there was not a concept of afterlife from the beginning, or to the extent that there was, it's this very vague sheol, uh, <clears throat> and and it it's not clear what that means, and there definitely isn't the bifurcated you know good people go here, bad people go here. Um, and of course, you know that's that's controversial within Christianity too. I, I tend to, um, I'm really interested in the thinking of the 19th century uh, uh, Scottish writer George MacDonald, who uh, is one of the most convincing and eloquent proponents of the idea of universal salvation. I tend to think that if there's a possible universe in which I am saved, I, I cannot imagine a version of sal- eternal salvation for me because I'm so fucked up. Like, if Jesus can fix me, he can fix everybody. It'll just take a long time. Uh, that That's just something, that's something almost in, instinctive with me. So I, I'm, I'm not completely sold on the bifurcated afterlife too. But yeah, definitely within, within Judaism, my understanding is that's much less. Yeah, and it was just like you you do this thing because that's the rule and like, you know, the ancient rabbis figured out what the correct rules were 2000 years ago. And, you know, if, <laughs> when you're a kid, you question, question these things like, why can't I eat a cheeseburger or something? <laughs> and the explanation is not going to make sense to a nine year old. Um, <laughs> that's the great thing of religion about, about a religious childhood is that you just like get used very quickly to the fact that the adults cannot explain everything to you. <laughs> my, my dad and I, uh, I, Oh boy, do we disagree about a lot? And and sometimes I get there are areas where I get very angry with him uh, and find some of his views uh, like like they genuinely I find them repugnant. Uh, but I love the guy uh, a lot. And one of the things I I really love about him is that he is has always been interested in theology, um, just sort of. Uh, I, because it's important to him and not because he was, you know, getting a grade for it. And he would, we, he would engage me in these conversations about like predestination and, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> what does it mean to say that God wills our salvation, but that we also have to take this step of, you know, assenting to a belief. And when I was like four, um, and, and I, I love that. <laughs> that was cool. Uh, there are a lot of things I, I am not ha- at all happy about about growing up fundamentalist, but that intellectual earnestness, which more, remi- I mean, that's not typical of people's stories of their fundamentalist childhoods. You more often hear those kinds of comments from people who grew up Jewish. Because hmm, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, I mean making someone learn Hebrew. Like I've tried, I've tried to teach myself Hebrew. That shit is really hard, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's, it's a cerebral, it's a cerebral practice. It makes people smart. It makes people good at arguing. Um, okay. Do you have anything else before we wrap up? You want to say about religion and doubt and certainty? Well, I mean, I could spoil the conclusion of the article a little bit. The, the, the thing that I'm really trying to get out there in people's heads is that, any any discourse that gives you ultimate answers to like what should I do in my life, how should I act, um, involves a leap of faith somewhere, uh, and I don't think that the so the article is not it's not anti secularist I, I, I you know uh, it's not anti people of other religions because uh, I think God loves those people and died for them. So, you know, it must be okay. But uh, it is, I am trying to get into people's minds the idea that the leap of faith that you take to say, I am a secular person who believes in human rights and democracy and the leap of faith that I take to say, uh, I believe we were made in the image of God. 
they are both leaps of faith. Neither of us got there by math. Mm -hmm. Neither of us got there by de sheer deductive logic. Uh, we both just decided this is this is what I'm about. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know that goes back to the founding of America, America when they said certain rights were inalienable and uh, just proclaimed that instead of you know making a, a direct case for it. You take some things as axiomatic and you proceed from there. It's just how reasoning works. I, I'm, basically, I'm doing a dumbed-down version of like the arguments that Polanyi, Michael Polanyi makes in personal knowledge insofar as I understand them. I'm just dirtbag Michael Polanyi. That's what this <laughs> is. It's, it's, if Michael Polanyi read, read too many comic books and his book was broken. Okay, that's a good place to end it, I think. Uh, I think so. <laughs> so, Phil, thank you for coming on to talk about your pieces. Uh, the link's to them will be below. Uh, you're on Twitter. Is it Phil underscore Chrisman? Chrisman, yep. And that yep. link will be there. Um, and uh, your, your website link will be listed below as well. But is that, what is, what is that link? Philip, philipchrisman.com. Okay, cool. Um, so. Uh, yes, all in Philip, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, every, all those links will be, will be below the video if you're watching this on the website um, or not on YouTube. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you can visit the website li linked, which will be below, and you can get those links. Uh, so, yeah, thank you to all of our viewers and listeners, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.